So a very, very warm welcome to everybody, especially to those of you who've traveled from various parts of regional Victoria. We're really delighted to have you here. We hope we can reciprocate at some stage in the future. This is definitely not intended to be a, an, an evening that says the regions must come to the city to hear what needs to be here. On the contrary, and I hope you'll hear more um, to give you a sense of um, what, what we hope to engender as far as that goes. I'd like to extend a special welcome to Ali Kappa the independent member, let me underscore that, independent member of the Victorian Legislative Assembly for the seat of Mildura. I acknowledge that we meet tonight on the customary lands of the Wurundjeri. And I also pay tribute to the many ways in which Aboriginal communities of this larger region are working against the odds to care um, for their land through revitalised customary practices. Shortly, we're going to hear from Ross Lake on the topic food, water, and community. And it's important that you know that Ross's talk is not an isolated event for us here, but rather launches an exciting new project for the Institute, which we have titled, not very modestly, I might say, The Future of Food. We began working hard over several months to establish this project, and we've recently had the good news of success in a small grant from the Lord Mayor's Charitable Trust. This grant, alongside a separate private donation, and most has allowing us to get off and, and, and get this project running. Most particularly, Lauren Rickards, who I'd like to point out in the corner over there, who is the, um, the project's lead researcher. So she'll be getting going on this in the new year. At its heart, our project aims to stimulate a better quality of debate about the challenges facing our food system at a time of catastrophic climate change, drought, tensions between cities and regions, and most strikingly, an extraordinary lack of political imagination and leadership from the mainstream political parties on all of these matters. But I imagine some of you are thinking, well, why are we here? You know, what does an institute of post-colonial studies have to offer a debate about the future of food? The answer to that question can really be as long or as short as you would like it to be. I'll give you, you know, one version of a short answer. Settler colonialism is not just an act that results in the dispossession from, of Indigenous land from Indigenous people. We can say that the dominant settler colonial attitude and its presumed superiority over all other kinds of relationships between people and environments runs through every aspect of our society. And we believe it establishes the very basis of the crisis that we find ourselves in now. But we also know that across the country, there are many individuals and communities who reject the arrogance of such an attitude. The time is ripe for new kinds of coalitions between people working on the land and the rest of us to connect up over concerns for the places in which we live, how we produce and what we eat, and ultimately for how all of us live together. And we're very much aware that all sorts of people and groups and communities are working on these issues at the moment. We're just very keen to bring what we see as the unique contribution we might make to that larger collective struggle. Ultimately, our interest in these matters is utopian, certainly transformational. We wish to help cultivate a people's movement that demands and puts into place a different kind of coexistence. And this place, the Institute, has been vested in these debates, not just at the level of ideas, but through the practical commitments of some of its key personnel over a long time. So indeed, our foundation director, Philip Darby, who is with us here tonight, up the back, who set up this place, founded this place in 1996, is not just a critical scholar, but a fine walnut farmer. <laughs> 
and indeed that's where most of Philip's energies and passions lie in the present. But this new project that we're embarking on now owes its roots, I have to say, to the exceptional vision, the energy and the termination of our marvellous patron, Stefano de Pieri. Stefano, it's wonderful to have you and your passion and commitment in our midst. I'm personally very deeply grateful for the time and energy that you've dedicated thus far to helping steer the IPCS ship on this new adventure. Tonight, all of us together are celebrating the end of a wonderful year, and I hope that after tonight's talk, you'll all stay on and celebrate with us, share some discussion, share a, a nice meal and a drink, some conviviality, the, 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 the special thing that we think of as lying at the heart very much of Stefano's gift to all of us, conviviality. If you're new here, if this is your first time at the Institute, please do look us up online, learn a little bit about what we do. If you're in a position to do so, please do take out a membership. It won't cost you a lot of money, but you'll be able to be part of this growing project that we're trying to build. And indeed, if you're in a position to consider contributing to our Future of Food Research Fighting Fund, please seek me out for a little bit of a chat. Okay, so I'm now going to hand over to Stefano, who's going to introduce Ross. Thank you, Melinda. I'll be very brief because, thank you, because a lot of you already know Ross personally. There are friendships here that uh, have developed over a period of maybe 30 years or more. But for those of you who are not uh, familiar with Ross, and uh, let me just say that uh, uh, Ross is a significant figure in the Northwest. He's a businessman, a very accomplished businessman, and he has been a stalwart of our community together with his family. It's just not one person, there is always other people behind or in front, rather. And um, so Ross has been has covered many roles, many roles in the Mildura community. He's being instrumental in, in developing Mali Family Care, which he was still chairing, is that correct? That's a very large welfare organization. He supported the Mildura uh, Arts Mildura, or the Mildura Arts Festival, if you prefer, and then he supports many causes to many to list, and his modesty wouldn't allow me to uh, to, to list them to you. Suffice to say that um, He's a keen observer of what goes in our community. He's chosen to keep his business in our community. He could, given the nature of his business, he could be in Collins Street. But he is in our town, employs our people, and, uh, um, and that's a very deliberate choice about being in a regional area. Um, the rest uh, will become obvious during, during the talk. He is also a, a historian in pectore. I think he is the one who really knows truly the history of our region and how Mildura came about. Um, that's a bit of a secret passion, I suppose. Uh, but with that said, give him a, a welcome. And I'd also like to associate um, with the welcome that Melinda made before to our local member and also to Helen, um, who is here with Ross. Thank you all for coming. I might just use this microphone if that's okay. So that works okay. Thank you very much. Look, thanks for the invitation. Um, this invitation to talk about my community and its relationship with the water we use, uh, and that water ultimately gets used to make the food that we produce. Uh, it's really important um, to understand the meaning of water in our community. Uh, it's not uh, just what comes out of the tap, it's actually taken on a more intrinsic value and I'll, I'll sort of expand on that. Um, apart from Steph's invitation, I'm here tonight because uh, I had an experience only two weeks ago. One of my staff wandered in, my HR manager wandered in and said, oh, I've got an application to uh, for one of my other staff to cash out their leave. And I'm always a bit wary when uh, people have to cash out their leave. And I said, is there a reason behind this? You know, I'd rather people took holidays rather than cashed out their leave. And we're talking thousands of dollars here, obviously, many thousands of dollars. Uh, and Liz, my HR manager said, 
oh, they need the money to buy water. They needed the money to survive on their farm. So I'm here to tell you about the meaning of water in my community. There's some, a couple of little qualifications. I sort of geofence most of my comments around, uh, around Mildura itself. I'm not going to talk about the Mallee. Katie Holmes has just done that beautifully in her book, Mallee Country. If you haven't read it, there's a plug. Uh, go, go and look for it. It's, I've already had a chance to dip into it. It's, it's fabulous. Uh, and I, I won't be talking about the Indigenous connection to water. There are people far more qualified than me to talk about that, particularly about the, the distress uh, of the drying up of the Darling, or the Barker, as it's called. Uh, and if you want to read a nice article about that, go and read my partner's article in the Age Insight of about 12 months ago called Crimea River. And I think that really sums it up. So with, with that said, ultimately tonight, all I might be t telling you is uh, a story about precariousness, really, uh, and really a story about the fragmentation, what I see as the fragmentation of a community and its aggregation to something else. Uh, whether that, whether that's just the same old story if uh, everything ultimately dies and changes and turns into something new, uh, I guess the challenge is for us to accept whether that something new is better or that something new is what we preferred or what we chose uh, as a community. So uh, I do live in Mildura, uh, as Stefano said. Uh, I've lived in Mildura since 1956. I wasn't born there. Uh, I was actually born at the other end of the Murray in Albury in New South Wales. So I'm intimately connected to the Murray-Darling Basin. My business runs from Tumut to, uh, to the South Australian border, down through um, Murray Bridge, Border Town, Narra Court, up to Broken Hill, down to Bendigo. So I'm truly, that's my archipelago, Paul, that's one for you. <laughs> uh, so, you know, I'm truly a creature of that. Uh, and that probably brings uh, some biases and some conflicts of interest. So just accept those uh, as, I, as I go along. So really, to, to put a flaw in the narrative tonight, it's, it's probably only fair that I give you a bit of a, a really a two minute potted history of our district's relationship with water because there's a couple of key elements of it that you really need to understand and one of those elements is our independence in relation to water. I know it's a colonial settler community. I know it's a failed utopia. So we have to e accept those things but it's there. It's a community of 50,000 people at minimum, rather larger if we count the electorate. But, you know, it's a, it's a community uh, like m many of the river communities, and we can go down through South Australia, through the Riverland, or upstream, you know, to Echuca, Kerrang, Swan Hill, and the likes. They, they all have very similarities, and, and I might add some real challenges. So uh, I'll take you back to the 1880s, if you like. It's about then that the Victorian government really started to think about um, water conservation. That was really the, the beginning of the thinking about it. And it created a whole series of trusts to, to control, fund and create water instrumentalities. But there was sort of one uh, outlier and that outlier of course was Alfred Deacon who met the Chafees in California uh, and ultimately granted them an indenture uh, he was the Minister for Agriculture in Victoria at the time, ultimately grants them an indenture for and water and access to water, a deal with the New South Wales government in the Mildura area. What's most important about that is whilst the balance of the state has its water instrumentalities controlled by the state, the water instrumentality in Mildura is controlled by the people of the town. So it's a collaborative sharing arrangement. That's a very, uh, and it's very important to understand that. It's, and the legacy was a thing called the First Mildura Irrigation Trust. Um, of course, the Chafees fail, as we all know. The, the land boom in Victoria collapses 1891. There's a Royal Commission into the failure of Mildura. We might be heading for another Royal Commission after some of today's news. And, and uh, ultimately, 
the blame or the finger is pointed at the, the chafies. Um, I won't bore you with that. Through the, that, so that's the first stage that sets uh, our, our story about our relationship with water. Between around 1905 and uh, just post the Second World War, you know, we see the development of all of the pump districts around us. But within Muldura, the independent FMIT is retained. The pump districts are controlled by what uh, was then called the um, State Rivers and Water Supply Commission. Uh, and they, they were essentially run by the bureaucrats of the state in a very controlled and measured way. But the FMIT, the old district, retains, retained its independence up until it was ultimately gutted by the, I think it was the Brax government got them in the end, yes. So the Victorian Water Act in 1958 is really the first point at which we start to view water as a volumetric allocation against land. So that changes everything. Our take, if you like, our take from the consumptive pool to that point in, in relation to water is really as of a needs basis. If it was available, we took it. There was the beginnings of the the beginnings of measurement. Um, a thing called a death ridge wheel was created, and there was beginnings of measurement. But it wasn't it, it wasn't that we could view the units of this resource as anything other than um, sort of a magic pudding. So, um, so. Pushing forward, I said this is a real whistle-stop tour of our relationship with water. Pushing forward to the 1890s, uh, 1990s, we've got 1890, 1889 Water Act again in Victoria, which for the first time recognises that we can tr transfer water, that we can actually transfer water with the ownership of land. We haven't and this is the word that you will have heard, we haven't unbundled water as a resource from the land at this point. We don't do that until 2007. In 2007, we unbundle water from land. So we actually separated it as a tradable entity for the first time. So that's a really big psychological leap about the meaning of water to our community. Now, I love this word because unbundling sounds benign. The better word is the one used internally in the authorities that actually create the paperwork around that process. They use the word disassociation. So the process is a disassociation process. So land and water become disassociated. And that's really where we've got to uh, that's where what has developed because this has been a creeping virus in our community. You know, it isn't suddenly something that hit us like a drought or hit us uh, and was reflected in the social indicators of our community straight away. You know, it's been a slow burn, that disassociation psychologically of that fundamental resource that what was essentially viewed as social capital, so a social good, and a shared good, and in which we had agency in the management of, that, that stage of disassociation was a, key, it was a key point at which the community had to reassess how it viewed water and what it saw water as. So around 2007, of course, we get the introduction, we're six years into the millennium drought, Allocations of water are falling. We've got John Howard's rescue plan for the basin. So it's so everything's changing around us. Um, we, we've got the creation of what everyone in Mildura calls the CHU. The CHU is the Commonwealth in, Environmental Water Holder. So we get the beginnings of buyback. So we get the beginnings of uh, environmental the environmental buyback. And the, and the impacts of that's reflected in the drying off of a lot of properties up to 40% of in some of, the, some of the controlled pump districts. Uh, in fact, I think we ultimately gave up about 20, when I say gave up, you know, there's some emotion in that word, ultimately 
about 23% of that social good, if you like, of water uh, went back to the benefit of the environment. I might add, I think that's a good thing. As I pointed out to someone the other day, uh, once upon a time the environment had 100% of the water. So our take was always take. Uh, so don't, don't, um, don't make any moral judgment of me. Yes, I do own water and I do trade in water, uh, and, but I do grow things as well. So, so that little whistle stop tour through the best part of uh, 130 years, it's important to sort of have that narrative in your head when I talk about some of the other things I want to talk about. So uh, the fact that we face challenges then isn't particularly new. Um, there's gaps in that little history that I gave you and people ask specific questions, I'm happy to sort of fill them in. Uh, I probably should tell one brief story about, because uh, I wanted to talk about proximity uh, and the proximity of our, um, our policy makers to my community. At the height of the Millennium Drought, I had to go and make a representation to the then Water Minister, which was, I think it was John Thwaites, uh, was here in Victoria. Here in Victoria. Uh, and we rolled up, and of course you're always met by the advisor first, uh, which is always entertaining as well. And, the, and she rushed us into a side room and laid out a map of Victoria on the table and she said, um, can you just show me where you come from? Now, you know, we can giggle about that, but, you know, that has, that has stuck in my mind for the best part of 12 years now. This is the Water Minister's senior assistant asking me where Muldura was on a map of Victoria. So, so we've always had struggles. So, so in, in each of those five distinct periods that I talked about, you know, we've clearly faced issues around government reg regulation, drought, the environment, things have been changing around us as a, you know, a white settler utopian, failed utopia as I often call it, um, but that's very unfair, I do love the place. Uh, and, and we've shown enormous resilience over all of those years. So where are we at today with water, with food, and maybe some of the social indicators? And that's one of the little problems. I can talk about where we're at with water, I can describe what I think happening with food, but can I dr draw a chain of consequence through to what I see in terms of the, uh, the social indicators in my community? We've, we've only four times assessed the social indicators in my community. 1945, Melbourne University did it for us because all the academics escaped urban Melbourne. Um, because they didn't, I guess they didn't want to be there when it was bombed, uh, but, and set up Melbourne University in Mildura. And, and so they did, one of the things they did was a social indicator study in 1945, fascinating actually. And then we did one in 2006, 2009, and about 2016, I think. So, and, and there's some telling statistics in those social indicator studies, so I'm just gonna share some of those with you later. So in, in, uh, in our history, the very idea of water is um, written into our history. So the book about, the 1938 book, which has been reprinted 15 or 16 times about Muldura is called Water Into Gold. Now, nothing could be truer about water <laughs> Today, I'm sure um, I'm sure Ernestine Hill didn't uh, didn't think about the situation we find ourselves in today, but it's a bit prescient, isn't it? Water into gold. Well, water is the gold now uh, in our community. The other book that I love is Sid Wells's um, Paddle Steamers to Cornucopia. Um, Cornucopia being the vision, the original vision of Muldura as a sort of a a producer of a fruit salad of goods, uh, not a monoculture, but a fruit salad of goods where the the, the middle class Englishman or could come and um, uh, grow a good Protestant family uh, with 20 acres of dirt. So, but my favourite is uh, 
C.J. DeGarris's book, and, and the title of his book is prescient as well. It's called The Victories of Failure. So, wonderful book. If you can ever, ever get a copy of it, it's wonderful. DeGarris, of course, failed horribly. Um, if anyone knows the story, uh, suiciding, but being very, uh, very conscious of those who might follow him or those who might find him, leaving a note for the, uh, the gas fitter who he'd rung because he'd put his head in the gas oven, leaving a, a note saying, don't smoke. <laughs> so, uh, so it, in 2010, um, I started waving some red flags about what I saw that the Basin Plan might promulgate. Uh, and I was invited to go and address the Senate Standing Committee on Water, which was a bit of an experience in itself, in Canberra. And, and at that time, you know, the water market was in its infancy. Uh, we really couldn't see far enough into the future. The drought had broken. Uh, water, seen, water was 35 bucks a megalitre on the temporary market. Um, just to give you some idea, today it's $1,000 a megalitre on the temporary market. Uh, so things were pretty rosy in many respects, but the plan was under construction, or the plan part one was under construction. Some of you may not recall the history, but there was um, a fairly severe backlash along the Murray for the initial plan uh, in that you know some people were piling them up and burning them. In Mildura, we did something far more Southern European. Um, we filled a gum, gum boot full of them and poured concrete into the gum boot and threw it into the river. <laughs> so, uh, so anyway, there was a fair bit of contention. So people, uh, w the government in its wisdom, wanted to hear from people in the regions what they thought we should look out for in the plan. I really only told them um, five things back then. Uh, I, I told them very pointedly that uh, be very careful about the unbundling and the market that you create uh, because no one in that room, you know, former union officials, former union officials, Heffernan, Simon Birmingham and a couple of other um, notaries had any idea about markets. And I said, well, I'm, a, I'm an oil trader and that's what I am. <laughs> Uh, markets are very different places to a rigid demand and supply curve. You know, they're essentially asymmetrical. So once you create that market, think about risk takers and deep pockets. So everyone had no proximity to the issue who were, who were part of this review of the plan and to be frank, despite good, some good advice out of the Murray-Darling Basin uh, Commission, as it was then, now the Murray-Darling Basin Authority, I don't, I don't think that they were visioning out sufficiently. So uh, if everything's going to end up in the pockets of risk takers and, and, deep po and deep pockets, you know, be very careful because there's an inexorable and unrelenting drive in an economy. And that's capital. And the people who've got that capital now are the bloody baby boomers, me. I'm a, you know, I'm in right in the middle of it. And they're retiring and they're going to look for a better return than a treasury note. And they're going to be wanting a better, better return uh, than one, two percent. And that capital's got to find somewhere to go. It's got to go to where it can earn six, eight, ten percent. So the warning was issued, it wasn't listened to. I also said, please dismiss the willing sellers myth because all of that water, and you know we can argue the moral of who owns it and who doesn't own it, all of that water is going to be given up by distressed sellers and opportunists. And I, you know, I'd like, I'd like to say really simple, really, really straightforwardly, that's what's happening. So I told them, if you measure it, if you measure it, you can manage it. 
Now, we knew from experience within our, within our pump districts that we were measuring it because we had metres. But the whole of the northern basin didn't have measurement and didn't want to be measured. It still doesn't. <laughs> still doesn't. <laughs> Correct, I heard someone say. And still resisting proper measurement and still arguing about, you know, uh, interception, floodplain interceptions and the like. So, and I said, you need a perfect storm plan because everything looks pretty rosy now, but you need a plan B. And here we are at the beginning of the next drought, or the beginnings of the next drought, and there's no plan B. I also said, devise soft landings for your communities. There's two million of us in the basin. So when you get your policies out and you see the distress, make sure there's soft landings out there. And what I meant by that is avoid policy collisions with the state government uh, that allow land to lie uselessly, you know, with its infrastructure ripped up, uh, with its drainage ripped out. Uh, try and avoid that. They didn't avoid it. So the last thing I said is you've turned water from a social good, which was collaboratively and collectively in many c communities managed at a local level with agency and proximity to the issues and knowledge of the issues into a medium of exchange. Once it's a medium of exchange that has all the characteristics of money, and you know what they say about money, the love of money is the root of all evil. You know? So where are we now? So 2010 waved all those flags. A number of those things have come, uh, have come into the play in terms of water in our community. But most importantly now, I see water and its allocation as a zero-sum game. And what I mean by that is you've got a, a finite resource. We've, we've actually um, ring-fenced the, the resource, maybe correctly because we needed to, We've ring-fenced the re resource and the consumptive pool, what, what people get to take from it, what the environment gets to, to take from it, is now finite. So every time, someone ta every time I take something, you lose. So we don't have a win-win situation at all. We actually have a zero-sum game working across the basin. That's very dangerous. I, I was actually interested. I saw the Victorian government announce that it was going to look very closely at the water market and ensure that no one had more than 2% of the market, I think was the announcement. I thought, well, that's terrific. My maths tells me that ultimately 50 people can own all the water. So if we're going to cap the ownership at 2%, then ultimately 50 people are going to own all the water along the Murray-Darling Basin, or along the Victorian side of the Murray-Darling Basin. I'm not, I'm not sure that they've quite worked that out yet. So th this, um, there's another sort of pressure in our community too. For many years, you, you sort of could go into debit on your water use, uh, so you could carry forward a loss, Paul. <laughs> You can't do that with water <laughs> anymore. You can't go into negative, uh, a, a negative holding of your water in, in anticipation of a better season or the, the magic pudding or the magic pudding of right refreshing on July 1. So you have to always have a positive, there's no overdrafts in water, I guess it's the simplest way to put it. You always have to be positive in water, in your water allocation. So the old, as I said, the old pump districts in our community were, had water service committees where growers sat on them and the like. Now it's all really one centralised government controlled authority. So, and the food that's produced from that water really, um, you know, is, is now chasing the capital that allows that food production is now chasing better returns. So we're not, so it's not, please don't ever buy the myth that the allocation of that resource will go to its best use and the best and most efficient farmers will utilise that water. 
because really it'll go to those who can afford the water to grow the crop that'll get the best return for the Canadian Pension Fund. So that's, a, and that's an impo so that drift away from what water meant to us to what water means to someone else as a medium of exchange and an, and an investment tool is, is changing our community. So who, well, who owns the water now? Um, so, uh, the, the transparency of water registers, Victoria, New South Wales, South Australia, is uh, variable. The, to the Victorian government's credit, the transparency within its register is really good, but there's no interoperability between New South Wales and South Australia and Victoria in terms of who's got what and who's using what. So there's no, staggeringly, there's no precision instrument or precision centre that says on the map here, this metre here is running and it's running out of that resource against that right against that allocation. And what I mean by that is you've essentially got a, if you, if you look at water, the available consumptive pool of water from the basin, it's like the reserve bank but there are no locks on the door. You know, literally, there are, and there's no one keeping the debits and credits, as in no one centrally keeping the debit, debits and credits. There's, excuse me, there's a veneer of that, but not something you and I can see. You know, we can see our bank. I can see my water bank account, my ABA, which is what it's called, and I can individually, but I can't see everyone else's. So, and I would have thought the resource was too valuable and too vital to our continued existence to allow it uh, really a wild west to, to, to be occurring. So, uh, I just want to have a drink. So, I thought... Water. Mm. <laughs> at, least, at least that one's free. Um, <laughs> So, look, I, I know um, people are coming up to my community in 2020 to, to uh, explore the meaning of water to my community, and I've thrown out a few ideas here. Uh, but there's, a, there's also uh, the distress that um, water, there's a, there's a considerable distress about water in my community as it flows down to South Australia. I wasn't going to talk about Lake Alexandrina, but I was going to appear in a Lake Alexandrina t-shirt, yacht club t-shirt, to, uh, to sort of make the point. The pol and the, really, the point's just this. The politics really has confused and distressed almost everyone in this, and the position of South Australia versus the position of New South Wales to, again, to be frank, the pretty honest position of Victoria about the resource. You know, it measures its best. It's got the best water register. It's doing a lot of things, I suspect, right, but it can't do much if other people are standing in parliaments in Sydney saying we're going to pull out of the plan. Um, that's, that's just not going to work. So Now, I, I wanted to move on to food. I'm just conscious of time. Um, this appearance this uh, this invitation to come here really was as a result of a telephone call from Stefano to tell me about um, the post-colonial institute's project in relation to the future of food and uh, I was feeling a bit provocative and I said oh god Steph you know food's just widgets now you know it's just something on a spreadsheet that get a can get a uh, uh, a good return and it doesn't matter what it is it's just widgets food's just widgets I mean saying that to Stefano is pretty deliberately provocative <laughs> so uh, he said and of course the response was oh you better come and talk to me about that uh, and and I, I you know I felt I then felt obliged to to talk about food because you know all of this all of this water we're talking about ultimately produces or we think it produces all of the food of the food bowl. 
given that 40, 43% of our farming is now almonds that go to India, I'm sort of starting to, that's a bit of a stretch to describe us as a food bowl, but we continue to do that. Um, so food. One of, the, one of the things that's worried me about food is its deseasonalization. So, there's, and what I mean by that is that we want to buy any type of food at any time of the year from uh, that, you know, we want to buy mangoes in the middle of winter, we want to buy avocados, well, the millennials do, I'm told anyway, <laughs> and whenever we like. So, that deseasonalization, of course, has got. Um, ramifications for our community and that we actually create competing monocultures uh, of big industrial farms. And those competing monocultures, of course, are again um, funded by that inexorable march of b baby boomer capital. You know, the, the baby boomers really are starting to retire their capital into not active investment but passive investment. And that's a, that's a really important change that no one's talking about. And I might add, all of the social studies that, um, uh, the social status studies or uh, the social indicator studies around the basin which have been conducted, all of them have ignored the big elephant in the corner, and that's the banks. No one, no one has done a debt to equity study of the farmers and everyone in the community. So we don't know who's traded off the equity in their businesses, their water equity, to, to stay afloat on the hope that they'll be able to continue farming with that working capital created by discarding th their water capital. We should know, but we don't know. We've got to, I know where the data is, but I know that no one's ever gonna give it to me. But that, that'll be the real test of distress, disassociation, fragmentation, all of those things of those communities right along the river, right through the, the basin. The test is really at that level. And that's where we need to go and look. So what's the debt to equity? Where's the debt to equity ratios of our communities? It's one thing we never measure. So, so I talked about the deseasonalization and how I thought that fed into other things with Steph. I talked about the industrialization and the large farms and how that feeds into you know, damage to the environment and, and all of that. But most importantly, I talked about the role of capital, which I've just explained to you. And, and also I talked about the depersonalization of those who work on the farms. You know, um, fly in, fly out islanders, island labor, is is not what you can build, well, not what built those communities. Those communities were built by, you know, the post-traumatic stress of World War One and World War Two farmers in many respects, and and their creation of families and communities. But now those large industrial farms bring in very different people, and 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 those industrial farmers, uh, and you know. The, they're good, hard-working people, but they make for a different community. Uh, and they don't necessarily have the time to run the local football club or be involved in local sports. They don't have their children here with them as families. A whole lot of different issues socially are impacted by the type of food production that we're seeing. So there's less community engagement. And, and one of my great distresses is it's very hard to get corporates to sponsor. You know, we, the tagline on my business is part of your community. And that's on every, every email that goes out of it. We're part of your community. So it's a very, so what's being molded is a very different community. The challenge, what I've said about water and what I've said about food, the challenge is to connect those things, those vectors, if you like, or those, um, those things that are occurring to the social indicators of your community. You know, where's the cause and effect? Where's the chain of cause and effect that, that says those, those things you're saying about disassociation, Ross, and about um, lack of agency, where's the cause and effect in your community? Can you see them? 
Well, before the last election, I was aware that the Murray-Darling Basin Commission had done a really uh, authority, sorry, I keep calling it the commission, um, the, the authority had done a really extensive um, social indicator study town by town around the basin. They weren't released before the election, before the federal election. They were released very quietly after it. Uh, so I went and looked for Muldurus and I thought, can I see any links to the things I think and feel about uh, what's happening with water and food? So I, looked, I went and looked at w the workforce in my community, its economic structure, the population of the town, the employment of the town, and the CIFA index. Now, there'll be a few sociologists in the room, I'm sure, that, and I'll, and, but I'll just give you some of our CIFA data and, and you can see the changing face of our community. Uh, the thing that in, the, in our workforce, and I wasn't going to do a lot of stats tonight, but this does tell a story, those involved in agriculture from 2001 to 2016 have decreased by 50%. Those involved in agriculture or manufacturing, in other words, value adding within that agriculture, between uh, the same period, 2001, 2016, have decreased by 19%. So there's a knock on. This is the one that staggered me. Those involved in government services workforces, and I hesitate to say this as the president of the largest community based. Uh, social provider have increased by 84.5%. So we're losing our middle class agricultural community and we're gaining a middle class social workers. We're actually gaining a service, a human services industry to, to service that ageing population. So I believe there is a connection. Uh, some, some of you might argue with me about that. The, the economic structure of our community between 2001 and 2016, agri agriculture fell from 22% of the, our local economy to 13%. The government sector of our economy rose from 19% to 29%. So what's, what's happening to our town population is growing, but it's growing with a really different type of workforce. Our employment's actually pretty good, you know, we're three, four percent unemployment and have been for some time. You know, Muldura is very re resilient, uh, culturally and ling uh, um, linguistically diverse community, uh, you know, and I'm proud of that. I think we, despite the news today, um, you know, I think that's an aberration and uh, the community's actually coped very, very well with wave after wave of, of migrants. So employment's pretty good. The one that worried me though was our CIFA index. The CIFA index is really measuring um, your access to material and social resources, if you like, and it measures us across four things, disadvantage, advantage versus disadvantage, wealth and education. Now in 2001, now just to explain, CIFA divides the whole country into 10 deciles, 10, 10 uh, stacks, if you like, uh, and then against those four main parameters measures where you, your community fits in that stack. So in 2001, my community in terms of disadvantage was in the 60 percent was you know so uh, so the the lower the number the more disadvantage you are so we were at six you know two racks at ten just to give you an idea of being smart ass there I know but <laughs> it's probably North Fitzroy where I live as well <laughs> so so it's so, so the lower the number the more distress or more disadvantage. So in terms of disadvantage, between 2001 and 2016, uh, Mildura's fallen from six to four, so more disadvantaged. In terms of advantage, it's fallen from seven to, to four. In wealth, it's fallen from seven, because the wealth's going out of the community now, to three, 
which is starting to get a bit precarious. And in education, it's fallen from eight to six, so we're just keeping pace with the rest of the nation there, because uh, it's pretty clear we're all in a bit of trouble. So, so are there links? You know, I'll leave it to a more academic, qualitative or quantitative study uh, between water and food production and those social indicators. But my suspicion now is that there are links. Well, I'll, I'll wind up because I'd rather talk to you than talk at you. I, I just wanted you to hear seven or eight words, really, tonight. I wanted you to hear precariousness, fragmentation, aggregation, proximity, the zero-sum game, disassociation, my favourite word, deliverability and distress. So with that, thanks very much for the invitation. Ross, thank you. That was incredibly fascinating and extremely sobering. Um, I'm going to start, if you're happy for us to do this, by inviting Associate Professor Lauren Rickards to come and have a brief reply, just some thoughts on her hearings from your talk, and then she's going to chair a discussion. Lauren. Thank you so much, Melinda. Uh, and thank you, Ross and Steph and everyone for being here for such an important conversation. Um, there's so many different topics. Oh, each one of those keywords <laughs> is, uh, is extremely uh, thought-provoking. Um, I've just jotted down a, a few things that came to mind as you were uh, talking, and it was very much about the way you were able to bring into view some of these often invisibilised splits that are occurring. And, you know, the first kind of notion of, of precariousness is the kind of papering over of these issues that we all manage to live, we all kind of survive mentally by putting ourselves in little bubbles, but it really is important for us to look beneath the surface. So, of course, the first one is the disassociation that you mentioned of, of water and land. And in a sense, it's a very technical issue. It's kind of an economic thing. But as you say, it's so deeply psychological, it's an absolutely radical shift in how we think about and give meaning to water. And the notion of actually allowing this to, uh, doing this in order for capital to kind of trace and, and follow the highest and best use or to actually dissociate water in order for water to be able to follow capital, I should say. Uh, I think is absolutely vital to our understanding of how water and economics are so entwined above and beyond the kind of cost that we face on our own water bills, that these two things are just deeply entwined. So seeing the role of capital in water uh, and the way that it's pushed for this neoliberalisation of water into a commodity, I think is absolutely vital. And as I said, you know, for us in the city, most of the time, kind of water exists in fairly contained, you know, ways, aspects of our lives, including the water bills, the water sector. And the idea that water is a sector, a single sector, is another one of these bounding um, operations that is so normalised in our lives. And I actually spent today with the, some members of the water utility sector uh, who are in charge of managing uh, Melbourne's growing uh, sewage epidemic. Uh, we've got way too much sewage in Melbourne uh, for our water treatment plants to actually cope with. So there's a really big issue there around population and, and for the actual water specialists. But nevertheless, it's very much what Jamie Linden calls modern water, which is an abstraction. The idea that water is what comes out of a pipe, it's what comes out of a, a jug, it's what we drink. And that blinds us to all the other ways that water actually exists, not just psychologically, but physically. One of the things that climate change, which I do a lot of work on, is training us to kind of re-see and rediscover is the way that water is not just the drink on the table, but water is very much the food on the table as well. So we're starting to think in terms of the water intensity of our food, just as we're trained to think in the emissions intensity of our food. And it's not just food, of course, it's all agricultural products and we're all sitting here in products that carry a massive water cost. 
And so starting to see water, as I said, not just in terms of like the kind of very explicit visible elements of it, but in terms of everything that we're doing, everything that we're consuming, I think is another one of the kind of in normalized splits in our psychology that you're helping us to, to overcome. What I would suggest is that we also increasingly need to see water not just in terms of these products, but of course in terms of the electricity that's flowing through this wire that's allowing this microphone to work. Start to see the water intensity of so many of our processes. You know, we hear a lot about the different emissions intensities of different energy sources, but one of the big things around fossil fuels is that it's also very, very water intensive whether it's the mining, the transport, the storage, the extraction. Just think of all the coal mines that have to be hosed down to stop them combusting in hot weather. And you start to understand that water again is implicated in all of these different ways. And so understanding water as a currency of climate change, but also a currency of our kind of modern predicament, I think is a really, really important thing. And so that's why having someone um, like you come here and start to peel away the layers that we kind of insulate our thinking about water um, is so important. The last one is about just the, the crucial elements and the way water as a community, a lost community um, object, a lost community good, social good, actually underpins a lot of the precarity that you're talking about. The precarity of households, the precarity of individuals. That very striking story you said at the start about someone uh, you know, foregoing their holidays and you know, with all of that, all of the family relationships, etc., that come with that in order to buy water, buy that modern water. I think, you know, just coming back to that opening anecdote is a hugely symbolic and thought-provoking um, way to finish. So I'll just stop there. Um, and thank you very much, Ross, for all your thought-provoking ideas. Thanks. Okay, well, we've got some real experts on water and Mally and Mildura in the room. Uh, so I'd like to open it up to questions. Um, and I'm sure some of you have reflections. As usual, please keep those brief. <laughs> and yes, over here, thank you. Thanks very much, it was a very interesting talk. And the it will concept of speak up. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, I can hear. I can yeah. Hear. yeah. Uh, seems like it's a very rich one that uh, stretches into all sorts of areas. I can see for one that it, it must imply something about what the questions are around framing. But your talk also seemed to me just to say that uh, dissociation means dissociating uh, uh, people from water, water from communities. It goes on and on mm -hmm. and on. It's a very... Exactly. Yeah. Yes. Um, that's exactly what I meant. Uh, and, and trying to find or trace that psychological um, trauma in a community means you have to go looking for the links. Uh, and you might have to presuppose links that aren't there. Uh, and I, you know, I did, I did conditionally say that when I said there's a chain there. It, is it a, a linked chain or is it just one of the vectors, one of those things uh, that are distressing my community currently, along with all the things that the modern world's distressing communities with? Um, but my suspicion is that our, uh, our water resource and the distance from it now, the increasing distance from it, you know, um, there are creatures in my community that never used to exist. They're called water brokers. <laughs> so, and, uh, you know, sort of on a par with real, well, I think most of them are ex-real estate agents. <laughs> so, uh, so, you know, that's, that's a new creature. And, and uh, already, of course, the ACCC's commenced an investigation into the behaviour of water brokers because when it did its trip around recently, the ACCC got a fair bit of flack around their behaviour. And of course, you know, as I said, this is a, it's a brand new jungle. So it's sort of like letting stockbrokers loose without any rules in many respects. Uh, so d should I mention the word ramping or uh, warehousing um, to influence a market? Now, I didn't accuse anyone of that. <laughs> Just to make it clear, there were no names. But really, that's a classic capitalist technique, you know. Um, uh, and 
who would deny them their opportunity to make a profit? I actually, I've been thinking some of those things through and I'll just share this with you. When water was first allocated um, and paid for and the infrastructure which developed paid for, it was all done by the state governments. Uh, and so the, the revenue stream was through to the, I'm not sure the state governments have entirely woken up to this yet, uh, was through to them. But now I go in and transfer water and the fee and that, just as an aside, that 95,000 megalitre transfer, I actually know the person who completed the forms for that between OLAM and the Canadian Pension Fund, which happened recently, people aren't aware of that, that happened recently. The, the fee to transfer that, there's no stamp duty. The application fee is $89.50. That was $350 million worth of resource. Now, if you, if you transferred a $350 million house, <laughs> right, here in Victoria, the stamp duty is going to be 50 million bucks. The state government didn't get anything. But the federal government, through its capital gains tax, is going to get it. So there's been a revenue stream that once or should have belonged to the state government, which is now, and this is a bit esoteric, I know, is now in the hands of the, the federal government. <laughs> Any other? Maybe, maybe it'll help fund the NDIS. Have we seen the, um, we seen the death of the, the small family farmer? Um, not being able to pay their debt because they can't afford it. Well, I think it's a matter of um, At one level, we have seen that we are seeing the decline, but I don't think the death because um, I think those, you know, for example, who have moved to organic bespoke to the bespoke. Uh, and have changed to, um, you know, we've got some initiatives in our community. Um, what's Deb's initiative called? Next uh, the, yes, yes. So the, those little uh, local initiatives using local farmers, bypassing the supermarkets and bypassing um, the large industrial producers, uh, hopefully in our future. So. Great. Um, two parts. Is dissociation entirely bad? And if you could change the rules of the current system, what would you start to think about? I'd cap and collar trade. And what I mean by that is I'd cease trading once, alloc once available allocation fell to a certain level. So that, that collar right, means that the uh, gross... Um, Gross profits that can be made when you get an explosion in the price uh, uh, disappear, and I'd collar trade at, at uh, a lower level to allow to allow when the water was plentiful to allow more water to go to the environment than its notional allocated share. That'd be one thing I'd do, and I would have completely transferable, uh, completely transparent uh, registers of ownership for all states with instantaneous um, logging of sales. So the sales information was transparent and available to all participants in the market, not just the brokers, not, you know, if you choose to be lazy as a, as a farmer in this market, then you, you pay a big price. So there are two things I would do. Is dissociation completely bad? Oh, sorry. Um, is it completely bad? Well, I'd, I'd rather have a relationship with water than not have one <laughs> as a community. Um, you know, it was a part of the glue of our community. I can't think of, I mean, I can say good comes of it if people make profits and those profits stay in your community. and But it doesn't. So... Before, um, those things did, you know, the transfer of properties. But, well, here's another interesting phenomenon that I've noticed, uh, and, and this is to do with the sale of properties in the community. Because that disassociation is available and you've got um, parents retiring and the succession plan for the property passing to the children, too often now involves, well, you can have the dirt 
but we'll keep the water. Because the water's their superannuation. You know, to give you some idea of, um, of the difference in value between the land currently and the water, uh, and I'll, I won't give you the exact numbers, because you'll just realise how big a capitalist I really am. <laughs> um, let's just say the, the land's worth $20,000. The water's worth $120,000. So the multiple between the value of the land and the water is six, seven times now. Mm. And so many, you know, you have a look, I was looking at the mm. Sunraysia Daily this morning, or, or, and, uh, which is our local newspaper, and the number of properties now being sold with a, a, an annual use limit, so you can still put water on the property, but not being sold with, al with water, with water right, permanent right, is increasing. Steph, you had a question? I, I, I'm always interested in what we can do. Um, what about putting a, um, a, li a, a time limit uh, on the uh, trading of temporary water? In other words, when the, the authorities decide that uh, the allocation is, uh, say, 30%, mm. instead of having uh, big water holders uh, hogging that, I have to be obliged to release it within a month. If they don't do that, they forego the right to trade until next year. Uh, well, I understand. Do you understand what I mean? Yeah, yeah, I understand. Um, everyone else mightn't, but no, what I mean by that is, you know, it, it is incredibly complex. And I always say to people, if you want to understand water rights, think of water rights and water allocation and ABAs and AULs and you know, the, all, all the lang esoteric language that goes around it. Think of uh, Europe before the common market. So if you look at the, if you, th if you think of the Murray-Darling Basin and all of the communities and all of the stakeholders and the three states and the, um, the multiplicity of municipalities and the multiplicity of reaches and the multiplicity of the descriptions of water as a share and a right and a a temporary right and a permanent right and a sales water and all the different classes of water, you're, you're actually sort of got Europe and, and its currencies before the euro. So can, ha, how do you apply the rule, I guess, that you just asked for, unless you've got a common currency? We don't have a common, common currency in the water. We don't have a co common, we don't, we're not measuring it, you know, cause, so we don't have, we don't, we don't actually have a way to do what you're suggesting. If we did, it's a good suggestion. Because it, 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 in, it, in, it, dis, well, it discourages the two, the two words that I talked about before, ramping and wholesaling. Mm. Mm. Yep. Um, Ross, the, the last couple of questions have been about, we've responded with sort of amelioration of the effects of the market. Mm. I just wondered if you go back to your moment in Canberra, yes. advising at the point where the water market was being created, yes. what other possible futures might have been possible at that point? Now, how, how else could the, the problem that was being addressed through the Murray-Darling plan, oh, uh, how, how, how else could it be done other than a market solution? I'd, I'd have spent the first billion dollars on an enterprise system which issued, which uh, issued every single person who took one drop of water from the resource, from the Murray-Darling Basin, with a metre. That's the first thing I would have done. And then all of those metres should have been able, and the capacity exists, to talk to a central, to a central bank. So, so, you know, so, like I said, like a reserve bank of water. So we knew, because ultimately that it's what makes it a social good. Because we would then know what was happening, but we don't know what's happening. That's the fun of it. So the first thing I would have done is, is uh, issue, ensured measurement. You know, I'm, I'm, obs I'm obsessed with measurement. <laughs> I mean, I do that every day. That's you know, part of my role every day is looking at spreadsheets of measurement of things. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Thanks. Yep, John? Yeah, thanks, Ross. I mean, you make the measurement of water sound like a straightforward process, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and I think that you're mainly talking about river water. So I wonder uh, if you... No, yes, I, no, I'm not, but yeah, I understand the, 
I think well, I know where you're going. <laughs> so are you, are you going to tell us a little bit about um, groundwater, uh, surface water, recycled water? Yep. Oh, I can talk. Uh, well. And, and, and the final one is uh, native tidal rights and water. <laughs> Ross, could you repeat the question? Um, someone asked me to talk about water in its broader sense, in that uh, water is not just the uh, surface water. You know, there's recycled water, there's uh, water, water in the aquifers. In fact, um, I'm sure a number of us know that the, the stream of the Murray that we see is probably only a fifth of the water that's actually flowing along, along that stream. The rest is flowing uh, underneath. So um, I am concerned about water being pumped up by aquifers. Um, I trade in the... Um, Murray Bridge, Border Town, Narra Corridor area, um, and <laughs> this is perverse. Uh, when the drought's happening, when I'm trading um, north of Wagga, I'm losing out. But if the drought's happening down there, I'm winning because they're diesel pumps that are pumping up all that water. Mm. Should it be measured? Yes. It should, be, it should be treated exactly the same. All of those resources of water should be treated exactly the same. You, you asked about um, indigenous water. I'm not, I, you know, I'm really loath to speak on behalf of any indigenous community and their view of water. I'm more, um, I'm more than aware of their concerns. I'm more than aware of some of the history around how, how indigenous communities view water. Remember, if you want to read some really good books, read Bobby Hardy's um, uh, West of the Darling and Bobby Hardy's uh, The Lament of the Bakinji, I think it's called, The Last of the Bakinji, about water on the Darling, about life on the Darling and water. They're, they're really worth reading. Um, but uh, I'm not the one to answer that question. I guess what I'm doing by referring to that is trying to emphasise that um you're talking about commercial allocation of water. Mm. There is a non-commercial view about water as well. Yeah, I didn't talk about recreation either. And I didn't talk about recreational use of, use of water. It's a, it's a huge topic. I mean, I actually have thought about, you know, there's a three-year degree here in terms of water and water politics and water use and the mythologies of water and meaning of water and the history and the whole lot. There's... It's an enormous area, um, but in 30 minutes. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> Carlos, there's a food arrived. Maybe it's a good moment, what do you think, to invite people to... Oh, we've got, we've got one more question oh, up the so back. Can we, we, yeah, that's all right. Yeah, please <laughs> go. Um, I'd like to know, like, we're going to talk about agriculture and how... I'm from Brazil, and you know in Brazil, 8% Water waste come from the agriculture. How you can think? You could think about manage the water in the soil to keep this water, like you say now, mm -hmm. like here, not under the soil, and change the way. Change the irrigation methods. The, or yeah, the irrigation yeah, no, we're, we're very slow there. How can make water in the proper How can we use it more efficiently? You probably need to come and see my partner mm -hmm. Helen's garden. <laughs> um, I, I, I actually think that the, the monoculture that we've created in terms of, and the way we irrigate that monoculture in Mildura is, I mean, we're stuck with it. It's an historical uh, structure. Um, but I, immediately a property goes out of production, I think there should be some thought about putting it to alternate use and returning it to bushland. Um, you know, and uh, quite frankly, this, and this is, I hope this, this statement doesn't end up in a newspaper, I would have thought everything west of Orange in New South Wales to the Queensland border and south to the Victorian border should be a national park. Yeah. yeah. We hope people really, do yeah. hear that. You want to spend 
a billion dollars, buy, buy all those farmers out, seriously. Um, it, it's going to be the, the best use for the land. Mm. All right, we've got two more questions. I just wanted Sorry. to comment that that really helpfully focuses our attention not just on land as the ground soil, but the water held in land with its vegetation and with all of its, um, you know, biodiversity as well. All right, we've got two more questions. Here, the last You're people right. have <laughs> last drinks. Yep. Okay. Hi, thank you. You just said something really interesting. You said we're stuck with it. What makes you say that? What do you mean by that? Oh, well, fortunately, we're not a dictatorship, and we and we just can't clean out the clean the farmer off the land. We, if this was China, I'm sure we probably would. Um, but you know, the, despite the fact that it's only 132 years of history, it's still five generations, six, six generations of of community. Um, and depending on how neoliberal we want to be, or or not, um, you know, I think that those people have invested in their community and, and that uh, we, we just can't, from no proximity at all, dismiss them. So, you know, I think that, but we could think about a transition. Mm. Okay, last question up the back. So, uh, a couple of questions. Um, Ross, do you think we've been gained, and I've been by we, I mean Victoria, has been gained by New South Wales against the way <laughs> That's the first part of it. And the reason that alerted me to that was your observation that west of Dubbo should be a national park. <laughs> New South Wales is clearing to death in that space. <laughs> so that's the first thing. And the second thing is, do you think we should be measuring the quality of the water that's in the system, given that your community, my community, is in jeopardy because of blueberry algae right now? Yeah. Okay, well, the first question first, are we being gamed? Well, politics is a game. So remember, a lot of the statements that you hear from Barilaro in New South Wales are about um, making an impression. You know, you know, he's just, you know, he's just playing to the crowd, in my opinion, because um, the principal resource and all of the northern basin and half of the southern basin is in New South Wales. The Murray River belongs to New South Wales, uh, effectively, um, and and you know the the actual agreement. This is um, something I don't think I mentioned actually. Uh, the the actual agreement around that. Um, there's a little organisation you might a little. Uh, I probably can't find it. There's. Oh yes, I can. I know where it is. Um, the, there was a point in our history which the states got together and agreed prior to the Murray-Darling Basin Plan. So, and that resource allocation that came, came out of that meeting, we're, st we're stuck with today, essentially. So there is a tripartite agreement between the states. Uh, but are we being gamed? Uh, you know, not, not really. I mean, um, there's... M my principal concern is that they get re-interested in us. No, right? My principal concern is that they're likely to promulgate legislation and policy which will have more and more unintended consequences. So I'm sort of, you know, I'm sort of saying the current situation in some respects might be as good as it gets. And the second question was about quality, I know. The second, remember the only reason there's water at Mildura now is the lock and wear system that runs, you know, from Gulwa up through, uh, up through to Robinvale, I think's the last lock, isn't it? Yeah. Now that was built in the late 1920s um, and it was meant to be a tripartite agreement between the states. Um, but South Australia ended up paying for it all because it didn't trust the other two. But it knew if it didn't control the flow, you know, then, uh, then we wouldn't be able to control one of the primary things, which is the quality of the water. If, if you look, um, our newspaper very generously provides a flow chart once a week of flows right, right through the basin. And if you look what's been happening, and this is what happened in the millennium drought, 
they've deliberately slowed up the flow to keep the weir pools for irrigation full because it, um, if you want to share the water it's got to be there if you want to take your allocation it's got to be there it won't be there if you let the the cliche the rivers run free so that flow control is what's causing the, the degradation of quality and you're I know you're talking about blue green algae well no farmer over allocated all the allocation rules um, were and all the original allocation was made by state governments except in New South no, no, farmers don't have never allocated water. They take it and use it, but yeah. Sounds like a good discussion for a glass <laughs> of wine. Um, thank you so much. And, you know, it's timely to uh, remember that, of course, you know, Sydney is currently facing major water quality issues given the feedback through fire and ash polluting their water system and unintended consequences. So there's just so many feedbacks and interactions here. You've opened our mind to many of them. So thank you so much, Ross. Please join me in thanking you.